Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this next Centre for Engineering History Seminar for the course 2023. Uh, firstly, a reminder that, as usual, the seminar is being recorded. And also, as usual, we will head to the ground floor with Dr. Wall Potler for drinks and dinner after, and we'd love to have you join us. So this evening, we're delighted to have Dr. Sonali Walpola presenting to us. Dr. Walpola is currently a senior lecturer in commercial law and tax law at the College of Business and Economics at the Australian National University. She's also a lead academic of the federal government funded ANU Tax Clinic and the co-editor of AusTax Policy, a forum for the debate and analysis of Australian and international tax policy issues. Dr. Walpola obtained her PhD in law in, um, at ANU and her research and publications concern the areas of taxation law and policy, the common law's historical and contemporary mechanisms for enforcing cases, and the High Court of Australia's role in the development of Australian common law. Today, Dr. Walpola will be presenting substantive bargain as the basis of consideration in contract, the argument based in case evidence, doctrinal coherence and principle, and discussion of the limited role of nominal consideration. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Will Paul. Thank you very much, Rosalind. It's lovely to be here. Thank you all for coming. So I'll start. So my paper concerns the nature of the consideration element in the common law action for breach of contract. My interest began many years ago when I was undertaking research for my PhD, which concerned the enforcement of promises at general law particularly in equity. In connection with that, I examined the historical development of the common law simple contract action. And what struck me was that it was clear, at least at the beginning, that the judicial inquiry into consideration was focused on establishing a real substantive bargain where each party seeks some performance from the other that they value. This was, well, quite fascinating to me because at law school I had been taught that a merely nominal consideration was sufficient to create an enforceable promise. In the last couple of years, I have been looking at the development of consideration in more detail. The central argument of my paper is that it is a substantive conception of bargain which to the present day provides a rational, principled explanation for the, for the judicial inquiry into consideration. In my paper, I first trace how the perception of the sufficiency of nominal consideration emerged. Then I argue there are two bases for rejecting its supposed efficacy. First, the coherence basis. Accepting the efficacy of nominal consideration undermines doctrinal coherence in the law of contract whereas accepting substantive bargain as the basis of consideration, which has a robust foundation in precedence, provides a principled basis for future development. Then there's the evidential basis. In any event, the sufficiency of nominal consideration was never properly established in case law. The cases associated with nominal and trivial consideration fall into limited categories where there is an alternative explanation in law apart from the nominal consideration. For example, the facts show a pre-existing liability. Consideration is not required for the remedy sought. For example, the plaintiff merely seeks return of their property. The nominal consideration is ancillary to a real bargain or the reference to nominal consideration is redundant as it appears not in connection with promises but conveyances of proprietary interests, and this includes so-called peppercorn consideration. What remains elusive are cases where nominal consideration is held effective to enforce gift promises, not in deed form. In English law, and for example, Australian law, that is not surprising when the facility of the deed is available for giving force to gratuitous promises. Before launching into the analysis and argument, I'll give a quick snapshot of the contracts framework at common law. There are two bases. Firstly, executing a deed. The invocation of legal formality is the oldest basis of promissory liability. Since the 13th century, the common law has recognized that any promise 
of lawful purpose can be made enforceable by executing a deed. The contractual writs based on a deed, debt on an obligation and covenant predate simple contract by some 300 years and never became subject to a requirement of consideration. The ability to enforce promises by invoking formality can broadly be rationalized on the basis of the principle of furthering individual autonomy described inter alia by Lon Fuller. Secondly, is the action for breach of the simple contract or a sumset, which today is often just called contract. It has been termed simple contract to distinguish it from the formal contract of English law, the deed. In modern contract doctrine, the elements of a contract are described in terms of offer and acceptance or agreement, consideration and an intention to create legal relations. It is consideration that has been there from the beginning in the 16th century when simple contract emerged. Being the writ that provided damages for breach of promise supported by consideration. Offer and acceptance and intention to create legal relations are 19th century and early 20th century additions to doctrine. Consideration is the defining feature of simple contract, conveying the common law's philosophy about what promises should be enforced in the absence of formality. If we examine core definitions of consideration in the modern law in England, Australia and the United States, as per Dunlop, Pneumatic, Australian Woolen Mills and the US Restatement of Contracts, Consideration is consistently defined in terms of bargain for exchange. The alleged consideration must be capable of being regarded as the price for the defendant's promise. This interest in bargain is not modern, but is seen in the earliest uses of a subset as a contractual action. There are also definitions dating to the 16th century that refer to consideration in terms of either a benefit to the promisor or a detriment to the promisee, but it has always been required that the benefit or detriment be requested or sought by the promisor, reinforcing the need for exchange. Now, despite that core definitions of consideration describe it as requiring a bargain, exchange, quid pro quo, in the leading contract textbooks, such as Chitty and Anson, which set the trend, we find statements that a purely nominal consideration is sufficient. From a doctoral coherence point of view, this is immediately problematic, given that core judicial definitions rely on notions of exchange. In terms of claims on nominal and trivial consideration, what I call the modern claim is framed explicitly in terms of the efficacy of nominal consideration using that word, it is expressed as a logical derivation from the court's lack of inquiry into the adequacy of consideration and asserts that nominal consideration is a means of enforcing gratuitous promises. The current claim appears in leading texts only from the second half of the 20th century. The precursor to the modern claim, which probably paved the way for giving it the appearance of plausibility, is a much older claim sourced to cases from an early stage, 16th century, which asserts the sufficiency of a slight or trifling benefit or detriment as consideration. However, these cases occur in the setting of other legal obligation, often a pre-existing debt and do not indicate that consideration can be used to enforce true gratuitous promises. Now I will examine how this modern claim on nominal consideration emerged by tracing the discourse on the adequacy of consideration in Chitty and Anson, with a focus on Chitty, which was the first to categorically assert the sufficiency of nominal consideration in the 1977 edition. This is the statement on adequacy of consideration in Chitty's first 1826 edition. Here, Chitty justifies the lack of inquiry into adequacy 
purely in terms of upholding each party's freedom to determine the value of the other's performance, without suggesting that something contrived and valueless could constitute consideration. Similarly, in the first edition of Anson, 1879, Anson rationalizes the lack of inquiry into adequacy on the same basis, stating the court is only interested that a man gets what he has bargained for, and while consideration need not be adequate, it must be real. However, deeper into the discussion of consideration, Chitty 1826 claims the sufficiency of slight benefits or trifling detriments as consideration, a claim that will continue to the present day. Among authorities cited for this point are, firstly, cases where one party evidently got the better end of the better end of the bargain, albeit that there was no fraud. Secondly, also cited are early cases where legal obligation exists in another action. Typically, the plaintiff is the creditor of the defendant and the plaintiff relies on an unonerous act, for example, producing a document that a debt was due, which is accepted as consideration so that the plaintiff could bring a subset, simple contract. It is noted that John Joseph Powell's 1790 work, often called the first contract text, also asserts the the sufficiency of trifling consideration gives prominence to two antecedent debt cases as, as illustrations, and the same cases have been cited in Chitty from the first edition to the present day. The inclusion in the adequacy discourse of this type of case involving other legal obligation appears to have laid the groundwork for deriving the supposed efficacy of nominal consideration. In the pre-existing debt cases, although the alleged consideration was not actually a component of a bargain, they are not gratuitous arrangements and do not provide supportive evidence for the modern claim on nominal consideration, i.e. that it can be used to enforce gratuitous promises. The first edition of Anson does not use other legal obligation cases in its analysis of adequacy but cases where the pleaded consideration really was part of a bargain. Revealingly, there is no statement in the first edition of Anson that a slight benefit or detriment will suffice as consideration. However, by the second edition, Anson includes a case where trivial consideration featured in the context of other legal obligation. Bainbridge and Firmstone which concerns a gratuitous bailment where the plaintiff's supposed detriment of parting with boilers for even so short a time was accepted as consideration for an alleged promise to return the boilers in the same condition as they had been given. This case has been cited as authority for the sufficiency of trifling consideration to the current editions of Anson and in many editions of Chitty. However, again, it does not provide supportive evidence for the sufficiency of nominal consideration as the trivial consideration is apparently accepted in a situation where no consideration is required as the plaintiff was only seeking return of their property in the original condition. Lord Denman's judgment even hints at this, stating that we need not inquire what benefit the defendant got from possession as the plaintiff owner could have given or refused leave. In Chitty and Anson, the approach to adequacy seen in the first and second editions respectively would continue for most of the 20th century. There was no suggestion that, co that consideration can be used to enforce gift promises despite the uncritical acceptance of the supposed sufficiency of slight benefits or, or detriments. For example, as shown on the slide, Chitty's 1961 edition, authored by Anne Smart, states that the adequacy rule is premised on parties being able to make their own bargain. 
In the subsequent 1968 edition, being the first occasion when G. H. Trital authored the consideration chapter, the discussion on adequacy is identical to that in the previous 1961 edition extracted here. In the quoted extract from 1961, I have highlighted the reference to equity. Past editions of Chitty and Anson have conveyed an essential correspondence between the concepts of consideration at law and inequity. And the discussion on the adequacy of consideration indicated the same approach at both law and inequity in the absence of evidence to negative consent. This is relevant for present purposes in showing that a real shift in exposition would occur because there has never been any suggestion that nominal consideration is accepted in equity. Now we come to the consideration chapter in Chitty's 1977 edition, which marks a paradigm shift. On the second occasion of Trital's authorship, the chapter is substantially rewritten and is the source of several significant statements that persist to the current edition. It takes a different philosophical approach to earlier editions, placing less emphasis on bargain. There is even a suggestion that the doctrine may not have a clear purpose, as reflected in the statement that English law limits the enforceability of agreements not under seal by reference to a complex and multifarious body of rules known as the doctrine of consideration. And for the first time in the 1977 edition, the section on the adequacy of consideration features a paragraph entitled nominal consideration. It is extracted on the slide. The passage asserts the efficacy of nominal consideration that a pound or a peppercorn can create an enforceable promise, for example, to obtain valuable property, and that this can be derived from the court's non-insistence non on the adequacy of consideration. This statement has persist persisted to the current edition of Chitty. A statement that is materially the same, which claims it is possible to make a gratuitous promise binding by giving a nominal consideration, appears 15 years earlier in Trital's 1962 book, The Law of Contract. This may be the first appearance of the claim in an English textbook. It is noted that there's no statement on the efficacy of nominal consideration in the first edition of Cheshire, Cheshire and Fivefoot's contract text published in 1945. However, what may be the first assertion of this kind by a jurist of English law appears some decades earlier in a 1922 Boston University Law Review article by Holdsworth where after noting the judicial non-insistence upon the adequacy of consideration, immediately then alleges as an, apparent, as an apparent logical deduction that a mere nominal consideration will suffice. The statement on the efficacy of nominal consideration and its purported derivation from the non-insistence on adequacy was not claimed to be supported by any new judicial development and no authorities are cited for the assertion in Chitty 1977, Trifles Law of Contract 1962, or Holdsworth's 1922 article. However, it marks a significant change in the exposition of contract doctrine. Previously, the non-insistence upon adequacy was rationalized in terms of upholding the party's bargain. This entailed that what could be consideration was limited by whether the promise or performance in question was something actually sought by the promisor. And this must be so, since it was claimed that the same rule on adequacy applied in equity. In Anson, a similar statement that asserts the efficacy of nominal consideration as a derivation from the non-insistence upon adequacy first appeared only in the 1998 edition and survives to the current. In the current editions of other leading English and Australian contract texts I have perused, there is a similar statement to that in Chitty 1977. 
The asserted efficacy of nominal consideration creates an obvious inconsistency with conceptualizations of consideration in terms of bargain, exchange, quid pro quo. To some extent, this inconsistency is recognized by Chitty, which briefly attempts a reconciliation by stating that the law only refuses to enforce informal gratuitous promises and the deliberate use of a nominal consideration can be regarded as a form to make a gratuitous promise binding. At its best, the assertion that nominal consideration is a form amounts to a suggestion that it is a device that can be deliberately invoked to indicate an intention to be bound. However, such a notion cannot be reconciled with the House of Lords decision in Rand and Hughes 1778, which strongly affirmed the essentiality of consideration in simple contract in a way that cannot be reconciled with nominal consideration. Here, an administrator had promised in writing to, sat to satisfy a debt of her intestate in her personal capacity without anything provided in return by the creditor, who did not promise to forbear from taking proceedings against the estate. Their lordships held that her promise was unenforceable for a lack of consideration and rejected the view in Pillens and Van Muroc 13 years earlier where Lord Mansfield and Justice Wilmot contended that consideration was merely for the sake of evidence, evidence of deliberation and reflection, and accordingly that writing could be a substitute for consideration. Chitty and Anson, continuously since their first editions, have cited RAN prominently for the point that consideration is not merely evidence of an intention to be bound. In current editions, RAN features early in the consideration chapter when introducing the concept of consideration. The efficacy of nominal consideration is, is asserted later when discussing adequacy, and there is no examination of how the nominal consideration claim might be reconciled with RAN. In rejecting the notion that consideration merely functions as evidence of serious promise, RAN strikes at the heart of the underlying premise of the nominal consideration claim, which posits that consideration can be used as a formality, as a proxy for an intention to be bound. Indeed, the judgment of Chief Baron Skinner in RAN indicates that exchange is the essence of consideration. Skinner opining that no sufficient consideration occurs to support this demand in her personal capacity, for she derives no advantage or convenience from the promise here made. Further, the suggestion that nominal consideration is an effective form and the attendant notion that it is sufficient to cast an arrangement in the form of an exchange cannot be reconciled with another proposition established in case law and which has long appeared in Chitty, Anson and other leading texts. This is the distinction between a conditional gift promise and a bargain. Both texts have drawn on the colourful example popularised by Williston of a scenario where A offers B £500 if B breaks their leg. Even though the form of an exchange is employed, this is described as an unenforceable gratuitous promise subject to a condition rather than a bargain supported by consideration. Chitty states that the essential question is whether a reasonable man would or would not understand that the performance of the condition was requested as the price or exchange for the promise. Here, at least, Chitty makes the argument of this paper, acknowledging that a valid consideration requires a substantive bargain. This is just a brief outline of the incoherence created by accepting the alleged efficacy of nominal consideration highlighting what might be deduced from a review of the consideration chapter in contract texts. The incoherence is actually very extensive and makes a mockery of established approaches to consideration, which are premised on a substantive bargain. I will now move on to the other difficulty in accepting nominal consideration, namely that its efficacy was never properly established in the common law. And that brings us to a historical analysis of consideration.
there is a large literature on the development of consideration in the 16th century. In terms of modern relevance, I argue the purpose that can be attributed to consideration at the beginning when the doctrine was established is fundamentally important in a system such as the common law, which derives its rationality from development in accordance with precedent. If a rational purpose can be identified at the beginning, the displacement of this purpose can only occur if there is a definitive change in judicial approach endorsed by high authority. The practical function that a subset simple contract fulfilled was providing a contractual remedy upon agreements when parties had not used a deed. The informal debt action, debt on a contract, was available without a deed, but it was limited in scope, applying only when the plaintiff claimed a fixed sum of money or definite quantity of fungibles. A subset appears in the 15th century, initially operating as a tortious action. In the first decade of the 16th century, the watershed development occurs and a sumset is first used for breach of promise without malfeasance. But despite this extension to nonfeasance, the common law was hostile to the notion that a person should be liable simply based on their promise. During the 16th century, the doctrine of consideration was de developed by common law judges to meet this need for a limitation upon promissory liability. At its birth, several key features of the requirement that would be termed consideration show that it is concerned with upholding substantive bargains. In the pivotal case of Orwell and Mortoft, regarded as launching simple contract, the plaintiff had purchased and paid for barley from the defendant, which the defendant failed to deliver, causing the plaintiff to buy, to buy elsewhere at higher prices. Chief Justice Frowick, at least, reasoned that Sumset was available by reason of the payment of the money, this being the first circumstance recognised as providing a sound basis for enforcing a promise. A subset rapidly evolved to cover a comprehensive and sophisticated notion of bargain, with judges recognising that any act of the plaintiff done in exchange for a promise was sufficient, even if it did not confer a material benefit on the promisor. The first reported decision illustrating this point appears to be Clement and Vincent, also the first case to recognise liability upon a plural guarantee. Where the plaintiff had been induced to deliver goods on credit to a third party in reliance on X's promise to act as guarantor, X's executors were liable on the guarantee. Initially, in the first half of the 16th century, the need for a bargain in substance is vividly demonstrated by the requirement that the plaintiff needed to have paid money for the defendant's promise or have performed the act sought by the defendant to bring a sunset. Saint-Germain's observations about contract in the contemporaneous source, doctor and student, show the primacy of substantive bargain. In this extract, Saint-Germain describes the common law position in terms of a very pure notion of bargain. Once you have performed your side of an agreement, you can have an action to enforce the other's performance. By the mid 16th century, a subset recognised that the plaintiff's promise to perform was a good consideration for the defendant's promise. The executory bargain had become enforceable, and as Fifewood puts it, the modern conception of contract had, in essence, been formulated. But the recognition that a promise was sufficient consideration did not mean that consideration became merely a matter of form. Judges were still concerned to establish a genuine bargain, and as Simpson states, judges frequently made reference to the possibility of reciprocal legal actions where the plaintiff alleged merely a counter-promise as consideration. This preference that the common law has shown through consideration for enforcing exchanges can be justified in terms of protecting and promoting the socially beneficial custom of bargain. As Adam Smith indicates, 
through bargain, we are able to secure things we want from others. And because of differences in value judgments and specialization, both parties can be better off as a result. This rationale is also seen in the scholarship of several American jurists as per the slide. Nominal and trivial consideration appears from time to time in the earlier Sumset cases and more often then than in the present day where we struggle to find it outside the setting of conveyances. It is seen in a limited context as foreshadowed where the plaintiff attempts to use a sumset where legal obligation was already recognized in debt on a contract. A sumset was more attractive due to procedural disadvantages with debt on a contract and it would effectively acquire the jurisdiction of debt on a contract after Slade's case recognized that every debt generated an implied promise of the payment. Prior to that development, particularly, nominal consideration was sometimes seen in actions against debtors, where a creditor pay, paid a trivial sum to their debtor for the debtor's promise to repay the debt. Here, as Professor Ibbotson observes, the reference to trivial consideration was merely accepted as a form of words to enable suit in a sumset, but was not the true reason for liability, which was grounded in the antecedent debt. Now, the court's willingness to accept the pleading of nominal consideration as sufficient here does not establish that nominal consideration will do in all cases. The nominal consideration is accepted in a setting where the law already recognizes the liability of the defendant in debt. In any event, here the parties operate against the background of reciprocal exchange insofar as the plaintiff was already the creditor of the defendant and had furnished quid pro quo for the defendant's promise to repay. Simpson, in fact, remarks that there appear to be no, instance, no instances in the early cases of nominal consideration being used to create legal obligation when none existed before. In the historical contracts literature, there is wide support for the view that reciprocal exchange is the basis of consideration in the 16th century and for around 200 years subsequently. It has been claimed, however, that consideration was eroded in the 19th century, and this is often attributed to the influence of continental will theory, which I will consider shortly. As a means of conveying my argument on the limited role of nominal and trivial consideration and engaging with the claim that consideration was eroded in the 19th century, I will consider a passage that has long appeared in Chitty for the supposed sufficiency of acts or omissions of very small value. The extract from Chitty alludes to five case illustrations. The material facts of the cases are not referred to, but brief claims are made, apparently indicating the sufficiency of trivial consideration. However, none of these illustrations are really authorities for trivial consideration, because there's either a pre-existing liability or the pleaded consideration really is bargained for. With the opening illustration of alleged trivial consideration, that there was a promise to give a man 50 pounds if you will come to my house. Gilbert and Rudyard 1608 is cited without any discussion. The facts were that a debtor had appointed the defendant to settle part of his debt to the plaintiff. And in that context, the defendant asked the plaintiff to come to the defendant's house to receive 50 pounds by way of part payment, which the plaintiff did. There was an effective admission in the report that the debt was the real reason for liability in a sumset, with the act of coming to the defendant's house treated as a subsidiary reason that enabled suit. The fifth illustration, which is said to show that even to show a person a document was consideration, is another pre-existing liability case, Sterling and Albany, 1587, 
which concerned a subtenant's liability to pay rent. With the other illustrations, the second to the fifth, they don't show trivial consideration, but rather are cases where judges have commented that the adequacy of consideration is immaterial in circumstances where there is nonetheless a true exchange. The third illustration, Reed Dale, it's 20th century, uh, involves, the, involves the doctrine of mutual wills in equity and in fact an executed consideration. The second and the fourth illustrations concern 19th century decisions which have both been cited for the alleged progressive erosion of consideration due to the influence of will theory and I'll turn to that now. Will theory places central importance on mutual assent as the basis of contractual liability. It is sourced to continental jurists and was embraced by common law contract writers of the 19th century. Will theory did have a substantial impact on contract doctrine, leading to the acquisition of additional formation criteria and the reception of vitiating factors. As noted in the literature, will theory cannot explain or justify consideration. However, we know that consideration survived as a formation element, as did the objective theory of contract formation, in spite of will theory. Whether or not will theory is, re is responsible, it has been claimed in the literature that common law judges of the 19th century eroded the consideration requirement by showing a willingness to enforce promises in the absence of exchange. If we consider the authorities frequently cited for the alleged erosion, there's Bainbridge and Firmstone discussed earlier. Indeed, it's not an exchange, but the dubious consideration is found in a bailment scenario where no consideration is actually needed for the duty imposed. Another case perhaps even more frequently cited for the alleged erosion is Haig and Brooks, which is the fourth illustration in the trivial consideration passage from Chitty. Chitty claims that this case shows that consideration could be established by giving up a piece of paper without reference to its contents. In many, but not all editions of Anson, the case is claimed to show that giving up a worthless document can be consideration. And this claim has been replicated in other texts. The facts were that the plaintiff surrendered a guarantee under which the defendant was apparently liable at the defendant's request and this was on the defendant's promise that he would accept certain bills of exchange. Later, the defendant argued that there was no consideration for his promise to back the bills. He claimed the guarantee was invalid as it allegedly referred to a past, not prospective advance. Lord Denman stated that it was by no means clear that the guarantee was referring only to advances already made and that it may possibly be intended as prospective. Contrary to the claims in texts, Lord Denman nowhere stated that the guarantee was worthless. Rather, rather, Denman took the approach that conclusively determining its validity was immaterial because obtaining it was in fact valued by the defendant, commenting that it was worth the defendant's while to possess himself of the guarantee. And it was in this context that Denman stated that we have no concern with the adequacy or inadequacy of the price paid. Revealingly, the first and second editions of Anson, which provide the facts of Haig with extracts from Denman's judgment, present it as a nuanced approach to giving effect to the party's bargain without, suggest without suggesting that it is an authority for the sufficiency of trivial consideration. Another case cited for the alleged 19th century erosion is Westlake and Adams. And this is the second illustration in Chitty's trivial consideration passage, where it is said to show that the act of executing a deed could be consideration, even though the deed was void. However, 
far from showing trivial consideration, it's a strong case of bargain. The plaintiff, an ornamental carver, sued the defendant on an IOU for the agreed price after providing a seven-year apprenticeship to the defendant's son. The pleaded consideration was the deed of indenture of apprenticeship entered into between the plaintiff, defendant, and a charitable society who paid part of the fee required by the plaintiff. The deed was only void because it did not state the full consider consideration for the apprenticeship, and it did not refer to the collateral IOU between the plaintiff and the defendant. The plaintiff was able to enforce the IOU against the defendant. As Justice Boyles pointed out, although void, the deed of indenture was in fact valued by the defendant, as it was treated by the parties as obliging the plaintiff to provide the apprenticeship. Moreover, the plaintiff had actually provided the apprenticeship. There was an executed consideration. As Biles put it, the defendant has received a full performance of the terms of the indenture at the hands of the plaintiff. Admittedly, there are positions in the 19th century, the 20th and even earlier, where the more natural explanation for finding, for a finding of consideration may be moral duty rather than reciprocal exchange. For instance, as in Hicks and Gregory, 1849, where the father of a child born out of wedlock had promised to provide the mother with a hundred pounds per year with the proviso that the allowance would be stopped if the mother behaved ill or brought up the child improperly. The court found there was good, good consideration for the promise. The court did refer to the moral duties placed on the father, but nonetheless, the court's analysis in terms of an agreement for the father's benefit is not artificial. Chief Justice Wilde described the principal object of the father's promise as to relieve himself from the obligation of bringing up the child and to cast it upon the mother. Hicks was followed by the Court of Appeal a century later in Ward and Byam. However, it would be incorrect to conclude that the common law in the 19th century or later reached the point of somehow finding a consideration to enforce any serious promise. In Eastwood and Kenyon, 1840, we have a strong authority that affirms consideration as an essential requirement for simple contract. The plaintiff had acted as the guardian of the defendant's wife during her childhood and had borrowed money by way of promissory note to finance her upbringing. The defendant's wife, when she came of age, promised to pay the note, as did the defendant when he married her. The promise was held unenforceable for want of consideration. Lord Denman, giving the judgment of the court, stated that the declaration discloses nothing but a benefit voluntarily conferred by the plaintiff, which was not laid to have been at the request of the defendant nor his wife while sole. The judgment provides a good counter-argument to the notion that there was a change in approach to consideration in the 19th century, because in holding that a past unrequested benefit was not good consideration, Lord Denman stated that the court was justified by the old common law of England, citing 16th and 17th century authorities, which are based in substantive bargain, Hunt and Bate and Lampley and Braithwaite. In terms of further 19th century authorities, where serious promises were held unenforceable for want of consideration, after very careful reasoning, we can refer to Miles and New Zealand Alfred Estate. Here an ostensible written guarantee signed by Grant, the promoter, director and shareholder of a company was held unenforceable for a lack of consideration. After a close examination of the evidence, including board minutes, the court rejected the contention that the shareholders and the company agreed to give up any claim they had against Grant. Although decided in chancery, as the company was in competition with an equitable mortgagee, the court relies on common law authorities on forbearance to sue. 
the protracted inquiry into whether there was any forbearance by shareholders is only rational if consideration requires a substantive bargain. Here, the signed written form of the apparent guarantee provided ample evidence of Grant's intention to be bound. The decision reinforces Rann and Hughes that consideration is not merely a proxy for an intention to be bound, as suggested by the nominal, nominal consideration claim. A further 19th century decision affirming the need for consideration is Re Hudson. Hudson had promised to make a series of payments to a congregational union for the liquidation of chapel debts and paid some in his lifetime. The union was unable to recover the remainder of the promised sums against his estate for want of consideration. Justice Pearson dismissed the suggestion that the risks and liabilities undertaken by the congregation could amount to consideration. Hudson had not requested the union to embark on any particular venture. In terms of 20th century decisions, there's Coombe and Coombe, Court of Appeal. After divorce proceedings were underway, a husband had pr promised his wife £100 a year, and this was held unenforceable for a lack of consideration. The husband had not requested any forbearance or anything in return. Turning to relatively recent case law, Lipkin, Gorman and Carpnell is an important decision for showing a substantive approach to consideration. Admittedly, consideration was relevant by way of defence rather than directly to promise enforcement, but nonetheless, the, the judicial reasoning cannot be reconciled with the efficacy of nominal consideration. A law firm brought an action for money had and received against a casino which had innocently received stolen monies from the firm's former partner, Cass. The firm succeeded in the action. The casino would have had a defence if you could show that it had provided consideration for the stolen monies. The casino could not directly rely on the gaming contract with Cass, which was void under legislation. But it argued that there was a preliminary and separate contract preceding the void gaming contract whereby it provided consideration for the stolen monies by providing chips in exchange for the money, which could be exchanged for multiple casino services, including refreshments. Their lordships rejected this argument, holding that the chips were in the nature of a receipt or token, a mark of the deposit, and not any considerations, not any consideration for the monies received. Their lordships equated consideration with the true quid pro quo given by the casino for the monies, being the opportunity to gamble and make profits, which could not be relied upon because the gaming contract was void. Chitty attempts to explain their lordship's rejection of the chips as consideration as a policy-based exception to the supposed sufficiency of trivial consideration. But a plain reading of the judgments shows no sign that their lordships were reasoning in terms of exceptions, with Lord Gough explicitly adopting a common sense approach in analysing what would constitute consideration on the facts. Returning to nominal consideration. To generalise, nominal, nominal consideration is associated with cases where no consideration is required for the remedy sought as with antecedent debts, bailment, which were discussed. And it can also explain the strained finding of consideration in relation to a careless advice case on the slide that predated Headley Byrne. The most frequent citations of nominal consideration occur outside the contract setting, in conveyances, grants. This deserves mention because Chitty and other contract texts assert that a peppercorn is sufficient consideration. And even Lord Somerville's dictum in Chapel and Nestle assumes a peppercorn can be consideration in contract. However, after having conducted electronic searches for references to peppercorns in the law reports, <laughs> it is evident that the only setting where peppercorns and other nominal consideration are frequently and systematically referenced, even to the present day, 
is in grants or conveyances where they are redundant. Leases of land and two types of conveyances of freehold estates recognised after the statute of uses. I'll just refer to leases here. Although a lease does not require any rent or consideration for its validity, only the grant of exclusive possession for a term, Platt notes that leases without rent are seldom or never met with. And there is a long history of peppercorns and other nominal consideration being referred to in leases as a method of technically reserving a rent where parties intend that the lessee not pay anything for part or all of the term. Many instances of peppercorn rents do not involve, do not involve gratuitous arrangements as where a substantial premium is paid on the grant of a lease and a peppercorn reserved as rent. However, even when no benefit accrues to the lessor, the point is that peppercorn rents do not prove the efficacy of nominal consideration in contract. A lease is a grant of a proprietary interest which does not depend on consideration for its validity. And invariably, the references to peppercorns are in leases executed by way of deed. As for normal consideration and options, that is promises to keep an offer open for a period, these are not gratuitous promises. The promise is made with the intention of inducing entry into a bargain and can be just justified by the principle of upholding bargains. This explanation of nominal consideration, that it arises in situations where no consideration is required, is seen in US law where nominal consideration is now acknowledged as ineffective to enforce gratuitous promises. The United States provides a unique testing ground as the efficacy of the deed as a means of enforcing promises has been abolished in many states. To conclude, embracing substantive bargain as the basis of consideration not only promotes doctrinal coherence, but also provides a basis for principled future development. In difficult or novel cases, the question whether there is a valid consideration can be determined not by a technical approach, but by assessing whether the parties have struck a mutually advantageous genuine bargain. For example, adopting a sub substantive approach can justify the enforcement of bona fide promises of additional benefits and concessions within existing contractual relationships if they are given to facilitate continued contractual performance. And if substantive bargain is accepted as the basis of consideration, this also provides a robust foundation for readily justifying an entrenched judicial judicial tendency seen across the ages, that is, the primacy given to executed consideration, as reflected in the strong judicial reluctance to hold that non-satisfaction with aspects of doctrine or technical defects should pre preclude enforcement after an assumed agreement has been partly or fully performed. I will now take questions from those in person and online. David. You seem to be ignoring uh, the action of debt before a subset. Um, I, yeah. You say that um, you had actions on deeds three centuries before on contracts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so by, by debt, do, do you mean debt on obligation? No, debt on contract. Debt on contract. Um, yeah, I, I hardly touched on it here. Um, look, I mean, I think debt on a contract with quid pro quo as the basis. I mean, I see a real commonality with the basis of um, simple contract. I mean, debt on a contract is, is, is limited in scope, but yeah, I, look, it's, 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 Quid pro quo is the basis of debt on a contract. I think that's the basis of simple contract as well. But it's yeah, but if yeah. you went back 
before the 15th century when quid pro quo seems to be absolutely dominant. Right. The, it looks at least um, as if the overwhelming idea is a motive for doing something. Right. And the motive isn't necessarily something given in exchange. I see. Yeah, see, I just look, that is where my knowledge is not, I, I, I don't have that much knowledge on this earlier phase. So I, um, so there, there was a period where it was not quid pro quo, but broader. It looks to be the 14th century. Right. Pro -quo. Okay, thank you. Uh, becomes dominant. Yeah. John Bank has it early. 14th century, I think it's probably a bit later. Right. Yeah, okay, yes, thank you. We can have different conceptions operating at the same time, right? And I noticed the 19th century pushback, quite a lot of it seemed to be coming from one judge, talking about the good old days with Denman. Yeah, quite a few cases, yes. So, to what extent do you think that might be a factor here, that, that people have moved on, but we are in the will theory world, and it's the same old idea of most of that exchange gives a good reason for thinking people intend to be bound, but, but it's the intention that matters, but we've got someone you know, polarising the past so, a bit. Yeah, so you're Joe? I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what, what would, do, you, do you have a view? I mean, I, I know, like, actually a number of the cases that I used here, and I've quoted Denman, but I mean, look, in Eastwood and Kenyon, for instance, it's it's really affirming consideration. I mean, is are there divergences that you see in the approach? Or? Beyond my way from my period, my area, my anything, but I just noticed with the cases that yeah. quite a lot of there seems to be quite a slender difference between substantive bargain generating enforceability and substantive bargain giving a reason for thinking it ought to be enforced, mm. um, which is that slip into will theory that, that people seem happening in the 19th century. And so I was just wondering. Um, yeah, so is, is it, uh, are you asking a question about Denman or? Well, to, if we are seeing a sort of 19th century pushback against mm. will theory, mm. to what extent that is one person's pushback as well? Oh, person. right, yeah. Look, I, I, I don't have a sense that it is, say, one... Oh, well, I mean, actually earlier, I mean, you'd probably... See, Lord Mansfield is, is, I mean, is re really quite, you know, I suppose, consistent with Will theory. I mean, Professor Ibbotson, do you have a view about, in terms of 19th century judges, that... Well, my view, yeah. I know about the individual judges. Yeah. I can't remember that detail. Yeah. Um, the problem is that law is always conservative. Mm -hmm. So you've got Rannan Hughes, um, a, a strong decision in 1780 or whatever, um, reasserting the consideration doctrine. Um, and that means that even if the judges are inclined simply to be giving effect to the will of the parties, they will always try to um, use the language of consideration mm. as well. Um, and we notice the, sheer, the volume of fictitious considerations, which you didn't talk about, the absolutely standard clause in the commercial contract uh, in consideration of five pounds received, which is hereby acknowledged, or on the bill of exchange for value received, which everybody knows is, uh, um, is a, an unprovable allegation, an unquestionable allegation, and similarly with promissory notes. So we're finding that in all of these situations, um, a bargain theory is disappearing. And it may be that they're just being channeled in those directions. Yeah, but you know, it, it depends really how, how broad the bargain theory is. So if it's, in, you know, to, to facilitate commerce, right? If I mean, I, I do not see that as inconsistent with bargain. Like, I mean, it, it depends what sort of how, how narrowly or broadly. Right. Yeah. Well, if what you're wanting to do is to facilitate commerce, um, then we're talking about commercial contracts, mm -hmm. and those will always be in writing. Mm -hmm. um, and once they're in writing, 
then you're going to be looking at the terms of the contract and then even, even moderately competently drafted contract mm -hmm. today will either be by deed or will include a consideration clause. Um, typically it will be consideration clause up till I think 2003 um, when stamp duty on deeds is abolished. Mm -hmm. Um, so people are not doing, doing things by deed because they just have to pay a tax on the on the on the instrument. Um, so there seems to be no reluctance to be enforcing these agreements for commercial benefits. Um, yeah, I think yeah, I'll I'll have to talk to you to to get a list of what you think are the fictitious consideration cases so that I could see whether it can fit with whether I can explain them in terms of substantive bargain. For instance, do you know of say cases where it's it's simply enforcing a serious promise outside outside this commercial setting? Probably is. I know very few cases um, in the 19th or 20th century, or at least in the 20th century, which are outside a commercial setting at all, because they don't go to the uh, to the High Court. But would you would would you agree that East Indian opinion, like oh, yeah. really, yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. I'm yeah. happy with that. Okay. Uh, what you've got yeah. after, uh, after Pillars and Van Myron is the um, reassertion, at least by some people, um, of the doctrine. Mm. And my reading is, or was, that the doctrine is having to be reasserted because it's crumbling away. Mm. There are people denying it, um, particularly where you've got uh, an agreement in writing. Mm. <coughs> Yeah, sort of two questions. Um, so on your examples that you gave, so Miles and Reed Hudson and Comb and Comb, I mean they're interesting because in Miles there was no consideration, right? There was yeah. so it wasn't really nominal consideration. Oh was, no, no. Yeah, but that, uh, that's right. And yeah. then in Reed Hudson yeah. and Comb yeah. Comb there there's no request. Yes. Um, and then Litvin and Gorman is a strange case because it postdates all of the change to nominal consideration. It's in 1988. Mm -hmm. And I think there's actually a fairly strong mm -hmm. claim that the tokens are consideration, at least if you compare it to that case of the rubbish, right, where this guy's collecting pieces of trash for um, and they find that like pieces of garbage are consideration. So, it, I mean, there might be an argument it's just, it's just a wrongly decided case. I mean, I was curious about, did you find any cases where there was a genuine request for nominal consideration that was found invalid? It seems like in all the nominal consideration cases, like there will be a, a request, right? Because it's not like one side's just sneaking in nominal consideration, it's that they both want it legally enforceable. And they know to make it legally enforceable has to be nominal consideration or some consideration. So one side will ask for it. Um, like all, all, all the consideration clauses, they ask for consideration um, to make it enforceable. So did you find any cases that would fit that bill? Are you saying sort of where, where the trivial consideration yeah, so is sort of actually wanted or so they, all yeah, this? They um, find a case where there's like normal nominal consideration and they say this isn't enough or they say this this is a spurious consideration because they, they just want it to make it legally enforceable, they don't want it because they're stupid or they can't assess the accuracy of the consideration. So did you find any cases like that? Is there a doctrine? Look, well, I found it very hard to find cases with truly nominal consideration. And when I was looking up the peppercorn, all I got was just lease after lease. And yeah. Um, so, so you're saying there's a there's a case about I I don't know this case that rubbish and yeah, yeah. Chapel and Hicks I think or Chapel and Hill. It's a, it's it's one of the cases that Atia cites for his. Like inventive considerations, because mm -hmm. he, he finds, yeah. I find he, because you, you discuss nominal and inventive consideration together, but to me they seem quite different because it's the sort of parties conspiring in nominal consideration, whereas mm -hmm. with finding consideration, it seems to be the judges who are yeah. conspiring to yeah. make them enforceable. Yeah. It, it seems yeah. like they yeah. perceive that consideration yeah. is a bar to a, a yeah. smoothly yeah. function. I, I, I included sort of trivial yeah. consideration as, as part of the paper because. 
that claim on the sufficiency of trivial consideration, there, there are um, the cases cited, a lot of them, they, the trivial consideration is not, is, is not anything bargained for. So th that's the link for me that, um, and, and it's for some other reason that it could be, you know, pre-existing liability. So it could be, you know, there's the, the negligence case, the, the, the negligent, what is really a negligent misstatement case um, before Hedley Byrne, where, you know, the, the court sort of, I guess, were, you know, ingeniously found consideration. Um, no, I, I can't say I, I know of cases where the trivial consideration was actually uh, actually bargained for. Right, yeah, it's tough because yeah. there's obviously a lot of cases that could be trivial consideration because they don't call it that often, right? They just find there is consideration. Well, see, it depends. See, if when, I, when I'm using that word bargain, I'm referring to the situation where a party actually does want a particular performance. Yeah, you mean intrinsically, not just to make it enforceable, the yeah, contract. Yeah, right. Yeah, because I guess what I was curious if that's actually the underlying principle mm. you'd expect it to be a rule, right, to be discussed. Because, I mean, in theory, that could, that could also, that could apply to any consideration, nominal or not. You could say, well, you didn't really want that seemingly substantive consideration, you just wanted to make it enforceable. Like, the consideration clauses mm. often well, will allege something substantive yeah. and big. Well, this, consideration. well I, I think the most relevant category of um, cases to what you're raising are the, the conditional gift promise versus bargain. Yeah, that's that, yeah, yeah. interesting Be ones, because yeah. yeah, because then the, the, the law is <clears throat> does need to be objective because you can cast you know something ridiculous in the form of an exchange. And and in one sense it sort of maybe fits your claim about, you know, there's an intention there, but, you know, there's this analysis of whether you really, you know, objectively, it can be an exchange. Yeah, I don't have to say, I've not read all the conditional gift promises. I want, I do wonder if the intention to create yeah. legal relations starts filling that function partially. Um, yeah, because I mean, like, like I said, I mean, obviously there are more examples, but the ones you give are tricky because none of them directly involve and are requested nominal. Consideration. Yeah. yeah um, to me, it's it's sort of if, if the law accepts that a conditional gift promise is it's it's unenforceable. It's not a bargain, okay? and that's a bargain in form only, right? And nominal consideration is a bargain in form only, right? You you can't hold that the conditional gift promise is unenforceable. And then hold that you can have nominal consideration. So what they have in common is that they're both purely formalistic bargains. So that's how I was trying to use yeah, no, conditional yeah, yeah, from, yeah, yeah, definitely connected for sure. Yeah, yeah. Do the 16th century cases uniformly require reciprocal exchange? Uh, what's that? The 16th century cases uniformly yeah. require reciprocal exchange. If that's the good old yeah. law, mm. then mm. I wondered whether you said that a mm. promise to pay an antecedent debt involved yeah. a reciprocal exchange. Oh, what I meant was, yeah, in, in a factual sense, that you know, it, it's not a gift promise situation. I, I think that it was, it is trivial consideration that is alleged. Yeah, but, but the, actually you raise a really interesting question about, um, you know, do they uniformly require exchange. And I mean, I think there's a wide consensus, but perhaps not uniformly. I mean, in, in the sense that sub substantive bargain is, is recognized as good consideration, but an, another category of case, pretty significant, perhaps, you know, marriage consideration that you know, a promise, yeah, perhaps, you get, um, Professor Ibbotson, what would you say about 16th century cases? Is it uniform in requiring 
exchange? More or less. More or less, yeah. What about marriage consideration? Uh, they uh, repeatedly tried to squeeze that in to uh, uh, reciprocity theory by mm -hmm. saying it's either a benefit to the father who's made the promise mm -hmm. uh, that he's got uh, his daughter off his hands, mm -hmm. um, or it's a burden on the man she's marrying that he's going to be wed to this harridan for the rest of his <laughs> natural <laughs> life. So both of those is particularly chivalrous. Mm -hmm. So what well, they are, I, I think, yeah, Certainly, my reading is from 1570, apart from a little blip in the late 1580s. Uh, they really are looking at um, something of value, though I do think it can be of trivial value. I think they will, or I'm sure as I can be, that they accept the trivial consideration as good consideration. Um, that seems clear, but it's certainly a reciprocity analysis. Or at least my view would be it is a reciprocity analysis. Mm. But it, would, you, would, you, would, you, yeah. would you say there's reciprocity in Megot's case? That's one of the cases. Yeah, that's 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 the yeah. 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 And then there's clearly, there's clearly this blip um, in the late 1580s where they are finding um, um, enforceable duties where when we look at it, um, indeed when they looked at it for about 1590, you're pushing the boat out. So some it would have taken over everything. Um, uh, Professor Ibbotson, when, when you refer to trivial consideration, the saying it was accepted in the 16th century, but what, what, what is the context? I mean, I've seen trivial cons consideration within the debtor creditor situation, but have you, seen it where it, it's really gratuitous? Well, no, yeah. um, because if it were deliberately yeah. gratuitous, yeah. they'd have used a deed. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. That, yeah. so, so that sort of... Uh, so um, it's just function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can clearly right. enforce yeah. your promises. So, yes. And there's no drawback yeah. to doing so yeah. in the 16th century. Yeah. No, you just got to have a lawyer drawing up mm -hmm. the the agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, the marriage consideration case is the hard ones, mm -hmm. um, and there they do fit it into the reciprocity mm -hmm. um, line. At least that's my reading of, mm -hmm. of all the cases. Well, that, that's good because, <laughs> and, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's supported the, the current claim. I mean, what I thought, you know, the, that you really that any promise can be made enforceable by, you know, using on the basis of a peppercorn. Any promise, even a gift promise. See, that, that was what I tried to find. And... Well, no, typically they wouldn't use a peppercorn, they'd use a penny. <laughs> That would make it enforceable. In what context, or like what uh, is this? Well, in particular contexts, uh, um, which I think of, are wagering contracts until they stamped on the one grounds of public policy. Because a wagering contract that, that can only be one winning party. Now, you can analyze that in terms of a bargain. Um, but the 16th century or the late 16th century judges are very reluctant to do so. So what the parties do, they just stick in. Each party gives the other party a penny in consideration for their promise to uh, to pay whatever um, if they lose. But we've got one, there's one, not particularly, we're not, uh, not in the printed reports, we've got Chief Justice Anderson saying, we will never examine the adequacy of the consideration. You've got Rastall's um, terms de la ley um, that says a penny is good considerate or is good, um, I don't know whether he says consideration or quid pro quo, but it doesn't matter, for £20. So they're perfectly happy to think of that complete mismatch. Um, but that's there in the, um, within the doctrinal literature. Um, and I've certainly seen nothing 
um, that would counter the enforceability of those. They look for some value, there's no doubt about it, they really do. Um, but they don't look for, they don't seem to look for any substantial value. Yeah. You mentioned a case of, of money for money. Yeah, that's what Rustle. Yeah, thought. because I thought that was the sort of uh, one fairly clear instance that's acknowledged that if the monies are not equivalent, then this it's recognised as a sort of a gift transfer, and that won't be upheld. Yes, I did read something about that, which to my shame I'd written. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's right. I looked at cases, a couple of cases in much, much, much more, uh, more detail. Um, Any further questions? I, I did have, just maybe to put pressure from a different angle, I was just wondering about the, the gift promise case, which I don't know too much about, but I think you gave the example of a promise to pay a sum of money if somebody breaks their leg. Uh, yeah. I just sort of, I don't yeah. know, like maybe I'm being stupid, but mm. I'm just wondering, is that is that really consideration at all? Is it even nominal consideration? It just doesn't seem, seem to be anything sort of passing from promise to promise or, and it seems to be not, not really of a piece even with a peppercorn, because a peppercorn is almost completely no value, but it's some value at all, whereas somebody else breaking their mm -hmm. bed. Yeah, be... that, that has been an example that has been used, and maybe it's not a great one for the conditional gift promise. I've also read, you know, promising some on money to go around the corner, you know, so something very unonerous. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I suppose the point the point was that the, the law can, does actually consider whether the promisor was seeking that performance. Because that, I mean, it sort of sounds a bit like a kind of like a gift insurance kind of case. I don't know what, what the point of that promise would be, but presumably to sort of effectively yeah, gift it, some piece some price. It, it is a hypothetical yeah, one about yeah, yeah. breaking the leg. Yeah. It's always difficult with hypotheticals. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, we might wrap it up there. Thank you so much again, Dr. Walpola.